good afternoon everybody. So many thanks for being with us today and uh, welcome to our fourth information systems research forum session this year on the future on information systems in developing countries. So before we start, I see quite a lot of new faces, so I just uh, briefly introduce what uh, ISRF is. So we are a research forum entirely led and managed by information systems PhD students at LSC. So basically the purpose of our symposium is that of bringing uh, the main topics of relevance to the field to attention and to discussion through the perspectives of uh, experts in our domain. So today's topic, today's topic in terms of information systems in developing countries, beside the element relevance of the topic for the field, is I believe an extremely timely topic especially in a crucial historical phase like the present one with the, the expiry of development of Millennium Development Goals in 2015 and with a huge rise in the relevance of the domain, of the topic for the domain of information systems at large. So again, so we have the immense pleasure and honor of discussing this with the three world-class experts in our domain. So we have uh, Professor Richard Hicks from uh, the Center of Development Informatics at the University of Manchester. We have uh, Professor Kizan Kergano from LC and uh, Dr. Cathy Mecker from uh, Brunel University. So in the first days I would like uh, uh, to ask you to mm, join me in a huge round of applause for <laughs> the topic for a 15-20 minute presentation each. We normally take only clarification questions in between the talks in order to have a wide uh, Q&A and discussion at the end of the talks. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Richard Hicks first for our first talk today. Professor Hicks will answer your invitation. <laughs> um, I've made a few copies of the uh, slides if you want to uh, have those. These, I've, I've added in a few extra slides so it's not an exact map of what you will see on the screen uh, because there's a lot of kind of detail and uh, behind what I'm going to uh, say today. So thank you very much to Sylvia for inviting me to speak to you. Okay. Director of the Centre for Development and Informatics, we're a group of about 10 staff, 25, 30 doctoral students, uh, 100 or so postgrads, all looking at various aspects of information systems and developing countries. And one of those aspects is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to endeavour to answer two questions. The first is, how is the international development agenda changing at the moment? And secondly, what are the implications of those changes for development informatics research? And development informatics is the term that we use for the academic discipline that studies ict to d policy and practice. Sylvia, so I think, referred to the Millennium Development Goals. As you may know, they were created actually just after the Millennium 2001. They were agreed, and they have a sell-by date of 2015. So something is going to have to come after them, and we're referring to that at the moment as the post-2015 development agenda, which I may shorten from time to time in my presentation to PTDA. And what I'm going to do in order to answer my first question is to compare the content of the post-2015 agenda with the content of the Millennium Development Goals, and then to answer my second question, I'm going to compare the content of the post-2015 agenda with an analysis of current development informatics research. Before I do that, let me just address the question of why am I bothered? Why, why look at the context for research? Why, when you're picking a research topic for your academic career, for your PhD, for your master's, whatever it might happen to be, why think about the broader context? Why don't you just pick a personal topic you want to do and, and get on with it? I, I would argue for three reasons. The first one would be 
month. The post-2015 development agenda is likely to shape research funding priorities, so if you're in tune with that agenda, you're more likely to get funding. Secondly, we're told that our research must be rigorous, original, and significant. Rigor is a largely internal <coughs> determined factor. Originality and significance are externally determined sections, both of which I think point us towards jumping into the fast moving currents of our particular research domain. We know that if you work in a new and fast growing area, you are more likely to be cited, read, used by other researchers and also by practitioners as well. And finally, on the assumption that the post-2015 agenda represents what is important and works in socioeconomic development, there can be no better guide to research that also makes a difference in the real world and has an impact. My presentation is based around some recent research that I did and an associated online working paper, actually two online working papers, one which answers the first question about the development agenda, second which answers the question about development informatics research. I haven't got a great deal of time now, so I am going to rush over um, the post-2015 process, which is shown and summarised on that slide there. And also, I'm not going to address two foundational issues, which I discuss much more in the online working papers, which are that, whatever its absolute strength, and acknowledging that there may be local variations as well, the post-2015 development agenda is going to be the single most important force shaping the future of international development and shaping the future of development research. And therefore, it's a significant enough force to justify spending time looking at it if we want to think about the future of ICT for do related research. So how do we do these um, comparisons? I've done it using text analysis. I analysed the textual content of these four, which are at present the four foundational documents that make up the post-2015 discourse. And for the first part of my presentation, I compared those with the three foundational documents that make up the Millennium Development goals and its surrounding discourse, one from the OECD and two from the United Nations. If you want to understand the details of how I did the calculations, I'm afraid you're going to have to look in the, in the working paper. But those calculations produce pretty graphs which you can look at. And this is the answer to my first question, which is how the international development agenda is changing. And I've divided that into four categories. First of all, what things are diminishing somewhat on the international development agenda? So what's diminishing are things that were quite hot at the time that the Millennium Development Goals were put together. So things like um, debt and drugs contained within the MDG 8, the idea that aid and donors are the central mechanisms through which uh, development is, is funded, reflecting sectoral changes, you can see that manufacturing declines somewhat relative to services, and reflecting somewhat the reduction in the extent of war and, and conflict globally since the MDGs, what you might think if you're looking at the, at the media, uh, insecurity falls down the agenda somewhere. Informatics, which you'll see uh, there, is part of my second category, which is issues which are continuing in the post-2015 agenda at about the same level that they were in the Millennium Development Goals. And within that, MDGs 1 to 6, which are the ones that cover health and education and poverty and women's empowerment. I was a little surprised that a couple of the items there were only <coughs> carrying on at the same pace. Urban development, institutional development seem to be particularly hot topics at the moment in the development agenda. But I guess they were already that was already known in the 1990s, so they were already incorporated as important topics into the MDGs 
and the continual post-2015. In the third category, those are items which are expanding somewhat on the development agenda. Some of those <coughs> represent real-world changes, so for example here, reflecting the fact that remittances and foreign investments are now more important areas of financing than, uh, than aid flows, at least in, in an overall sense. Some of the things which are rising there represent seeds of ideas that were sown some time ago and are only just now coming to fruition. So things like livelihoods, capabilities would be there, issues of rights and justice as well. And I'd also add in this element here, which is that technology and innovation were dormant really within the science and technology, uh, sorry, within the development agenda during the 1980s and 1990s, but they've really come back onto the agenda during the 2000s after the NGGs and are therefore captured now as well as the up the development agenda for the And then a couple of more recent things, because of the economic crisis in the West, growth and jobs are at a much higher level on the development agenda, also because of political instabilities and concerns about lack of growth, lack of jobs in other areas of the world. And I've also put here complex adaptive systems which have just come on in the last two or three years, particularly the notion of resilience. My final category of what's changing in the international development agenda is a set of issues which show a really strong growth in the post-2015 agenda, so let's say the next 10 to 15 years of international development compared to the last 10 to 15 years of international development. Some of these reflect real-world changes, so for example, the, rea the reality of climate change has pushed environment and sustainability to the very top of the development agenda. There's been a doubling of, uh, of international migration since the MDGs were put together. There's data showing that growth is being increasingly um, going alongside inequality and so inclusive development becomes um, a, a, a new paradigm of, of development that's uh, coming to the fore. And as I've mentioned before, this, this model of development of aid and donors working through government and NGOs is being replaced by a much more multi-stakeholder perspective on development with new stakeholders such as business and, the, and communities as well. And that last issue is partly a real world change, but it's also a change in world view about what matters in development. And the last two issues that I've shown there also reflect that notion of a change in reality, but also a change in world view. So openness moves quite strongly up the agenda. Openness in this sense of greater transparency and greater accountability. And the practice of development, development projects, really move up the agenda, particularly as compared to development strategy and development policy. This was an inductive piece of, of, of work. And often with inductive pieces of work, you can see the trees more easily than you can see the wood. In other words, you can see details, but it's harder to see the, the, the big picture. But elements of big picture you can see here is Post-2015 represents a richer and more multifaceted view of development than was reflected in the Millennium Development Goals. And we see two new paradigms, one of sustainable development and one of inclusive development, challenging the existing paradigms of neoliberal and human development. That's what I've drawn out. If you see other big picture elements within this inductive process, then you can bring those out. And finally, the punchline of the uh, presentation, which I was so kind of talking about. Before I do that, before they do that, I just want to break there because there's a lot of kind of stuff going on underneath in the detail of the working paper I haven't explained. Are there any clarifications or anything people don't quite understand what I'm, what I'm saying that you'd be right to clarify just at this point? Okay, all right, fine. So, this is the second comparative analysis. So, so the first comparison I did was the Millennium Development Goals against the content of the post-2015 documentation. This is the second comparison that answers my second question. And what I did here is, again, taking those four post-2015 documents, 
I then compared a whole set of development informatics research papers. And I picked them from three sources from throughout 2013. So I picked all of the papers which were published in the journal Information Technologies and International Development. I picked all of the papers that were presented at the IFIT WG 9.4 Jamaica conference last year, and all of the papers presented at the ICTD 2013 Cape Town conference. And those three sources are arguably the three leading sources for development, for specifically development informatics research. And as I say, I then compared them, and what this graph shows is the extent to which a set of development issues are either overrepresented in research compared to what the post-2015 agenda says, or, more often, underrepresented in current development informatics research compared to the post-2015 agenda. Using that analysis of over- and under-representation, plus also the earlier analysis about static and dynamic trends within the development agenda itself, I produced the following list of research gap priorities in development informatics. So 16 topics for 2016 onwards, running from the top. The first item represents the biggest ICT for D related research gap. This is the topic that is highest on the research agenda compared to lowest in our current development informatics research that we do. These are gaps, so that's not quite the same as arguing what actually should be our overall research agenda in development informatics post-2015. That is shown here. The main difference is all of those things on the list that were there previously are shown here. But there's a set of items down here which I'm saying are important, but they're already quite well covered in the amount, but the extent to which they're being researched within development informatics. So I'm saying these things should continue, but we find them already to quite a significant degree. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to talk about all of these items. I'm going to talk about five of the items that I'll show you. So first of all, on the basis of the textual analysis, environment and sustainability is far and away the biggest jump, the biggest increase on the development agenda for the next 10 to 15 years. And it is also far and away the biggest gap. In other words, it's very big on the development agenda and very little found at the moment in our ICT related research. Out of the 116 papers that I analysed, not a single one was about environmental issues. That's not to say there is no ICT environment and development research, but there's none in the sample I took, and there's very little uh, overall. So this means a number of things. It means that we need to expand a lot of elements around ICT's environment and sustainability development. There's a number of research topics we need to expand. So ICT's energy supply and development, ICT's water supply and development, e-waste development. There is a main issue that needs to expand, which is ICT's climate change development, particularly around adaptation but also around mitigation, monitoring and strategies. And finally, there is a research program that needs to be created. And that is understanding the place of ICTs within a sustainable development paradigm. In particular, how ICTs relate to what will be, and already is, a core issue of the 21st century, which is resilience. Poverty is at the top, not because it's expanded very much on the development agenda, but because it remains, alongside environment, a dual core of the development agenda. And while there's quite a lot of research being done around the issue of ICTs and poverty, there's very, very little research that seems to be direct about ICTs and poverty. I think one of the reasons that ICTs somewhat slipped away from the development agenda during the 2000s has been the relative failure of development informatics researchers to directly engage with the discourse and the theories of poverty. And I think, going back to that notion of dual core, unless we as development informatics researchers can
can engage more directly with the discourse, the debate, the theories of poverty and environment, we're going to find ourselves marginalised within development. The third topic I'm going to look at is ICTs and development. Development informatics research has been quite good at talking about the mechanisms and the processes of ICT for D projects. So participative, participative <coughs> processes of design, um, challenges of implementation, the means for evaluating <coughs> input. But what ICT for D research now needs to do is break out of the ICT for D bubble and show how ICTs can relate to all of these issues in mainstream development projects and management. So it needs to be talking about how ICTs can enable multi-stakeholder processes in ordinary development projects. It needs to be working out how ICTs can enable transformative development management techniques like Lean and Agile. It needs to be showing how ICTs can enable leadership of ordinary mainstream development projects. I said that the post-2015 development agenda would have these two paradigms. One is sustainable development and the other one is inclusive development. And again, development informatics research is going to need to break out of the ICT for the bubble of just looking at the digital divide, which is its take on inclusive development, and actually engage with all of the fractions of the inclusive development agenda. Two obvious ways in which we will do that. Firstly, engaging with inclusive innovation to understand how new ICT-based goods and services can be developed for and or by those at the base of the pyramid. And secondly, engaging with inclusive business for example, impact sourcing to understand how new jobs and incomes can be created for those at the place of the group. And the last topic I'm going to talk about is that ICTs have triggered a, a, a huge increase in the availability of data. And we now have a research agenda, and we have a, a serious research gap, because not very much has been done about this at the moment, around the data revolution in international development. There's a number of ways you can slice the data revolution, but I tend to pigeonhole it into three major trends, which is open data, big data, and real-time data. So, open data, there is quite a lot being written and discussed about that, but if you look at what's being written and discussed, the majority of it is very, very shallow and anecdotal. There's still a pressing need for proper academic analytical research, looking at things like the political economy of open data, how open data relates differently to transparency as compared to accountability. <coughs> Big data, we're talking about things like mobile phone records, easier access to mass survey material. There are a whole set of issues which are relatively location blind, in other words, which don't particularly specifically apply to developing countries. These are issues at a kind of upstream end of big data, so data production, data capture, data analysis, data visualisation. I don't see those as particularly development specific. The development specific research agenda is how do we get development value out of big data by changing development policy and practice, decision making processes around big data. And the same is really true of real time data as well. We've got this increasing crowd sensing in an overall sense of, of data, everything from people typing things into their mobiles to sensor-based uh, uh, data coming from the, from the field. Again, there is a technical and socio-technical agenda around data, data capture, data analysis, <coughs> data presentation and so on. But the interesting development research is going to come in the questions of how do we move from development processes and structures that were created around the notion of lagged data to much more agile processes and structures in development. To conclude, we can divide development informatics into five ways. So from the 60s to the mid-1980s, the real focus was technology transfer for modernization, modernization development. 
the next decade from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, when people like myself and uh, Krasanthi moved into the field, was particularly around information systems and context as the sort of a, a dominant theme. The third wave from the 90s to the mid noughties was when there was this huge rise of interest in the area as the internet started to happen in the global north, and people were talking really about the potential for ICTs and development and about access issues. And now we're just coming to the end of the fourth wave of development informatics research from the mid noughties to the mid tens, and the focus there has been on impact as ICTs have really started to deliver, and also with the influx of people from the hard end of informatics into the field on design. So the results I've given you today set an agenda for the fifth wave of development informatics research, which will run from now through until the mid-20s. I would like to say that the dominant narrative for that fifth wave might be development 2.0, which is something I'm particularly interested in myself, but I'm, but, I'm, but I'm not sure. It could alternatively be that the dominant narrative will turn out to be sustainable informatics and inclusive informatics, as, uh, as I put up there. But if you can see a better narrative, a better terminology that you think will summarise this coming fifth wave of development informatics research, then uh, do bring that out in your comments. And finally, if you'd like to know more, that is the paper that I have been talking about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hicks. I'm wondering if there are any clarification questions. Uh, any very important questions? Well, in that case, we'll move directly to the talk from the very Oh, that is one. Oh, actually, um, I have one just very simple question to Richard. Um, could you just clarify if you go back to the, uh, the graph? But Which one? The from yeah, from, from the very first graph, from uh, the comparison between the MDGs and post 2015. Uh, yeah, just so stop and get to it. Yeah, so the, the uh, yeah, so number of the uh, Y um, is uh, is it like kind of comparison between like uh, the MDGs and 2015, or is it like absolute number of comparison? Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. So so a little bit about how I calculated that. So what I did is I, I did a, each of these, um, and I won't go into them, but each of these are kind of portmanteau terms that are made up of, let's say, four or five specific text types and specific words. I did a word count of those, averaged it per 10,000 words for, so that we had something to compare. And then what I did is I took the absolute change and I also took the percentage change. I see. And then I averaged both of those, because obviously each one of those has its, has its own strengths and weaknesses. And then what I did, which is kind of weird, but I did double check it with the, something, there's something about stats in general. Um, what I then did is I, is I have expressed it in terms of standard deviations in order to enable it to be a portable measure that could then be portable as, for example, I've used a similar measure in comparing the development informatics research with the post-2015. Um, if you find something fundamentally wrong with that, please don't tell me because I've already published it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be mortified. But as I say, I did kind of go through it several times and think, is this, is this real? Is it, is it telling us something? And, and I mean, I think it is, because also, if you actually look at the raw text, which I did as well, it, yeah, it does make sense. I mean, it is pretty obvious that environment and sustainability has been talked about a hell of a lot more than, than, it, than it was before. And it is obvious that aid and donors and that kind of language is much smaller on the, in, the, in the debate around post 2015. So there's a kind of reality check. Suggest that we have one more clarification question? Just one? Okay. Um, hi, Richard. Come on, come on. I'm, I'm wondering um, how do you think we can, as researchers, um, use current projects that are already working with development and use nice teas in their projects? Because I know for my for former job, I'm from work of different uh, World Bank or IDB in Latin America. They do development and they do use ICTs and they have been working for a very long time with environment issues, but not from our uh, ICT for D or development informatics research agenda. So how can we match? So we cannot just try to reinvent our projects 
um, use what is being done in the field. Absolutely. So, so I mean, I think it's, it's really about how do you engage with what's already going on. So, I mean, I think the first thing is, and, and perhaps the only thing is, one needs to demonstrate some value added to the audience to, to, to develop an audience that you're seeking to or the academic audience that you're seeking to address, which is what. What can we say that, that is new and valuable if we're bringing, coming from an ICT angle? I will have to be honest and say I'm not sure what the answer to that is if we're specifically looking in the field of adaptation. In the field of mitigation, it's, it's fairly clear what ICT is bringing because they're bringing novelty. There's a, there's a requirement for innovation around smart grids, smart buildings, smart transport, all of those kinds of things. So ICT is a very clear value addition around the mitigation agenda. I think We've, we've just come off a kind of three-year project looking at ICTs and adaptation, and we found that very difficult to engage with until we came up with the notion of resilience. And that, I think, has been the way in for us to, to adding value. And what we're actually doing is we're going back to a number of existing projects, and we're now talking to them about ICTs and resilience. But we've only been able to do that because resilience has really risen up the agenda. Everybody wants to know what this, this thing is, resilience, how we measure it. And so it has a currency and a value that, that people on existing projects will say, oh yeah, okay, we want to know about that. Whereas perhaps if we just had gone in and say, oh, let, let's find out what's going on about, on about ICTs in your projects, they would say, well, you know, what value are you adding? Okay. So I am biased The thing that caught my attention uh, in Sylvia's invitation to talk at this uh, seminar is the second part of the title of the seminar, which is Exploring the Future. How do we research the future? We are most, I guess, here academics. How do we study the future? Um, we have to do rigorous research, as uh, uh, Richard said. We have various methodologies. Um, uh, I guess it is possible, practically, as again uh, Richard said, and we had a good example. I think what Richard did here was very much uh, an example of looking at current trends, understanding something which appears to be significant now, and analyzing its content to uh, try to guess to anticipate what will happen in the future. In general, in the field of IT innovation, let alone the impact of IT innovation, we have a very, very poor record of anticipation and prediction. Um, of course, the uh, bubble of uh, the late 90s is an excellent example of that, how high, speculative high, was built and how quickly it deflated and of course leading to all kinds of then retreating and hiding and not engaging seriously on what's the significance of technology and what is happening. But a simpler example, and I'm sure uh, those of you who have been in IT and development conferences will recognize this, is the following scenario. Almost in all our conferences, there are people who optimistically stand up and say, here is a project, this is what we intend to do, it's wonderful, isn't it? Here is what really we are doing. And obviously on the basis of a good experience, of a good example very often, something which is not only probably at the planning stage, but it has a successful implementation, from that we optimistically extrapolate that this is going to change the world. Well, it doesn't exactly happen like that, and very often in the next conference, the same person will go and ask, what has happened with that wonderful project? Oh, nothing really, you know, it was discontinued at all. Yeah, it's on, but I'm not quite sure it makes a difference. So, how we as academics develop the ability of understanding, anticipating the future? Uh, from where I stand, being an academic in an information system field, I think that's the role of theory. So the question is, have we developed adequate theories for understanding um, or being able to anticipate the future regarding development? There has been quite a lot of theorizing in information systems, foundational theorizing. 
not substantive theorizing, yes, there is substantive in terms of taking a specific issue and trying to develop the ability of understanding what is happening here and explaining what is happening, why it's happening in this way and on the basis of this predicting. But more, uh, I guess, interestingly, foundational in, sen in the sense of understanding uh, the relationship of technology innovation and social change, what I call uh, theories of technology. Now, uh, there has been quite a lot of work on that, and it is useful, but I would argue it's not quite adequate for understanding and researching IT and development. And the reason is that this kind of theorizing, for all kinds of reasons that I might uh, uh, want to, if you'd like, we can discuss at some point, um, is that it has been kept at the micro level. So we have developed very good understanding of the relationship. First of all, we understood that the effects of technology, the causal consequences of technology innovation, are neither the uh, result of uh, the technology functionality, the physical properties of the technology, nor purely uh, the uh, social conditions. But it's the relation. So the concept, for example, the latest fashionable context that captures that is the concept of affordance. So it's the property of the technology, but the property of the technology on its own does not uh, uh, lead to any specific consequences, but it is the perception of the property by individuals and in that way being able to relate with this and enact it and therefore make a difference. So the causal difference is not a matter of the technology itself and what the technology can do or what is built into the technology as functionality. It's not a matter of the social, uh, the socialized individual if you like, but it is the relationship of the two. And I think we have masses of very sophisticated, very interesting, very useful uh, abstract thinking about this. But it is very much at the micro level. Uh, why it is that, as I said, we can discuss it. But this is how it is. In a way, it happened like this. This is not quite useful when we study questions like what is happening with development. Because the development question takes us, I would argue, to a macro level. Requires us to understand what is happening in in the following relationship, the relationship of technology and its functionality with institutions. And by institutions I mean, first of all, institutional actors like the ones that uh, Richard analyzed earlier on, their thinking, their targets, their planning, their way of thinking, um, governments and regulation, but also institutions like um, cultural traditions, historically development ability to trust, uh, power relations again, historically development developed in different places, and of course bodies of knowledge which are uh, deeply uh, affecting the way people think, perceive technology and act. So my argument is that we have there a deficit of uh, theoretical thinking. And we cannot just, what is happening again and again is that, in a way, uh, we try to apply the micro-level theories of technology to be able to understand what is happening with development. And this, I would argue, doesn't uh, quite work. There is there a lack of theoretical uh, capability, and uh, it's, uh, I guess, up to you, uh, younger people doing PhDs and after, to be able to uh, develop uh, this uh, knowledge capability of understanding what is going on with technology, which would lead us to be able to anticipate uh, future situations. But with the, as I said, quite limited ability at the moment to uh, theorize in that way, let me try to uh, guess and in that way identify further gaps of uh, research and theorizing. If I take that at the macro level of development, it is very much the relationship of 
the capabilities of uh, uh, technology, the features of uh, the emerging technologies and the uh, capabilities of institutions to relate to that. I would say that, uh, of course, the advent of mobile technologies is an amazingly new phenomenon and it's very recent. For those of us who have been in the field of development, it was a pathetic research situation that we were researching that something that did not quite exist. We were trying to understand IT in developing countries and developing countries have very little IT. And suddenly, and again, as I said, lots of predictions that uh, were surreal very often. And suddenly, uh, after the digital divides, interventions by various institutions that tried to push the internet to the throats of people, take, giving them all kinds of justification why, it, why it's good for them, they didn't quite work, work in very few cases, and then suddenly after the discourse eased, that particular discourse, we started going to developing countries and they were awash with technologies. It was a different kind of technology, but it is extremely significant. Now, this is definitely a different type of condition than in the past. Uh, how significant is this? My uh, tentative argument is, but it is changing all the time, but at this point of time, is that the functionality of this technology is limited. Really very limited in relation to the functionality of information technology generally we take it uh, for granted. Um, and uh, in my uh, you know, one sentence uh, theory summary of IT and develop of, of uh, the theory of technology, the functionality of technology does matter. What technology, the technology properties are, what it allows you to do is extremely important. It can be compensated to some extent with um, other human ingenuity, but it is very important. And at the moment, the functionality of the mobile technologies used in developing countries uh, in uh, many areas is limited. It will undoubtedly develop. I, for example, the, the Indians a few years ago I went to a conference and they had policies to develop affordable uh, smartphones which I'm sure they will do, and therefore they will be able to connect uh, and open all the richness of uh, the internet and make it available to uh, everybody. But there is therefore still quite a lot, way, a long way to go in terms of availability of technologies that have uh, a, a, a crucial degree of functionality that can make a difference for uh, the large number of people who will appropriate it and uh, improve their lives. Um, but beyond the, the technology, as I said earlier on, the biggest stumbling block is institutional change, institutional reform. We all know that uh, there are policies for improving this situation, for improving government, for uh, improving um, the, the material circumstances, which is growth. Uh, I think that you cannot do very much. In that respect, I am very much a materialist in the sense that uh, without improving the economy, you cannot really do very much in terms of development. But um, the, the question for me is, and it is for us very important, and it goes back, it is a very uh, theoretical question, is can we think of any ways or why and how information technology, the information technology with the functionalities we have now, indeed lead to um, social change, to institutional change. Of course, it does require the thing to relate together. But, in a way, UNDP had a beautiful diagram some years ago which presented this technology-society relationship as uh, a cycle. And the question is, can we create a virtuous cycle? So the question is, how, if at all, information technology that we have today is possible to lead to the start of a virtuous circle of institutional change, for example, to make it more specific, um, improving government. 
we all know that a very significant obstacle to development in many parts of the world, including, by the way, the country of my origin, Greece, is government. Pathetically impotent and uh, suspiciously corrupt government. It's not only in Greece, it's in many, many other countries. Can technology do anything about that? Theoretically, how do we justify that? How do we see this happening? Of course, it is a matter of continuous trying both in policies like the ones that uh, uh, Richard uh, presented. But it seems to me that uh, if we try to anticipate the future, the role of IT and development and what is going to happen in the future as a result of all these policies, we need to have a mental direction in terms of causality, in terms of how the technology innovation that uh, happens everywhere, and quite a lot, of course, happens in developing countries themselves, relates to institutional change. So that it creates this kind of macro level change, not at the level of individual, which for what we study is so crucial. It's not so important for information systems that studies IT organizations and takes for granted an institutional environment. From the, uh, some of the recent results that I have been able to follow, uh, well, one case is Bui's study of um, uh, netpreneurs uh, in, in China. There are some very interesting clues there, which suggest the importance, of course, again, of institutions, but how, with some facilitating institutions, the whole thing can uh, somehow uh, create positively uh, changes that incrementally might lead to improving the lives of large numbers of people. However, it does point that um, the, the, the study of Bui was the use of um, uh, e-commerce platforms by very poor people to start earning an income, to get into business. But the most important facilitator there was a corporation. So that's where back to institutions. It was, of course, a corporation that was doing business with technology. It was establishing and selling and improving uh, IT services. But it was very much developmental in the sense that it was not only doing that online, but it was very much engaging with its customers to train them, to work with them to uh, develop capabilities for um, uh, doing business. So, uh, it, in that way, it somehow uh, compensated for some lacking capabilities and skills that they didn't have from education, from um, what is expected and understood as the context of innovation, say, in a Western environment. Therefore, uh, what I think uh, we do need to develop uh, and continue developing in uh, my field, information systems in particular, is that ability of understanding and exploring, to begin with, in terms of explan explanatory theories, how information technology is associated with macro level change and very specifically with institutional change. We are weak at that and I think without developing that, we, in a way, I would be able to relate to what you presented, which is such a good picture of here we are in the world of policy. I will be able to uh, understand what of these would have chances to lead to some uh, effects or not if I have better tools of understanding these relations. But I believe that this is very much neglected from our study of information technology and I think it's something for you guys to do. Chrysanthi saying how we shouldn't try to research the future and I think it's something we tend to say which makes sense in a way but could also be a bit of a lame excuse because the other 
uh, point of view of the city. I think it was Hunter Thompson who said the future is already <coughs> here, just not evenly divided. So if you want to reserve the future of IS, wouldn't it make sense just to find a solution that exists somewhere in a small corner of the world and then say, okay, we believe this is going to be the future, so that's what we're going to reserve. Well, in a way, we do research exactly to be able to anticipate the future. Mm -hmm. So it's intrinsic uh, in uh, the research uh, endeavor. Uh, at the same time, um, it, it is academic research has its own rituals of credibility, if you like. It's not a matter of mm -hmm. just I philosophize and I can tell you what will happen because I'm a wise person, for example or I'm not an artist to be able to improvise and out of that inspire you so you act in a particular way and that way you create the future. Maybe be able to do that if I'm a good teacher, but that's where it stops, not if I'm with a researcher. As a researcher, we of course have these categories of theories. Let me remind you that fundamentally we try to explain. It seems to me that explanatory theory, our uh, fundamental role is to understand what is happening and why and how. But this, for most people, is, uh, if you like, the preparatory research for them stepping forward and being able to predict. So it's ingrained in our uh, research culture that we should be able to predict. Uh, this requires predictive theory. And predictive theory is, at the moment, done on the basis of two things. One is uh, data and statistical methods. Well, we might come to that. <laughs> Big data, as Richard said, has hit us in the development field as well. Uh, I tend to believe that unless you have um, good theory to know uh, what questions to ask and what to expect, that is good hypothesis in a way, um, then you know, data mining can create all kinds of rubbish. So uh, it doesn't save us uh, from the real work, the really difficult work of being able to explain and on the basis of that um, form uh, hypotheses and you test them empirically with uh, data. That's why I think theory is very important. Theory at that level, at the uh, abstract level. I remember a long time ago, um, Richard did dare to say, "What has theory done for development?" And A and T in particular. And uh, I understand what you mean. Uh, at the same time, I don't think we can afford not to try. I feel that, as, as I said, we have not tried at the right level because of all kinds of institutional reasons. And I would like to know your view, actually that you still think that uh, we are wasting our time with your eyes at all. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the title of the piece was what get into the tour ever done for us. Yes. <laughs> and, and last year I, I did a, a special issue of working papers on A and T and development. So that, I guess that just shows how. That's <laughs> yes. How things, how but things you may have changed for tactical reasons for the REF or something. That doesn't mean <laughs> that you have changed your mind. No. I mean, certainly have changed my mind. I mean, absolutely. Um, 
social development safety net for good reasons as well, but you were saying that it's an alternative um, to look at capacity building, state building within Pose a challenge to us, and you seem to have taken it up 
-hmm. But you stop short in, in, in telling us anything about that. So um, perhaps it's for another talk. Certainly it's a long, uh, something uh, which you probably need a long time to tell us. But something about, so yes, you, you've done that research. And, and uh, what, what then, how did you manage to move, have you managed to come up with some theoretical concepts which will help us to build that middle range theory? Uh, I've I've certainly come up with um, some concepts, but uh, how, from the perspective uh, that I took, um, I came up with some concepts and then looked to develop uh, an existing theory further. Um, so it was the um, capability approach uh, of SEN that I looked to develop with the new ideas that I had. Um, I still think it's a work in progress, to, to, to be frank. Um, it's not something where I feel even if I had the entire two hours to myself, I could sit down and say, here's my new theory. That's why I started by saying it's not, um, it, it, it's not, some, it's not a job for the faint-hearted. Mm -hmm. I'm working on it at the moment. I'm getting closer, but it's certainly um, taken a long time. Um, I, I did present some initial thoughts on what I was doing, although I didn't um, use the case um, to any great extent in a paper that I had at ISIS in the lab. Um, and the two questions that people were really interested in there were, what exactly is a mechanism and how do you do this research? So they were very much looking for a, a how to do yeah. it paper, um, whereas I wanted to talk much more about the considerations that you had and the issues arising and so on. Um, so I'm working on a paper on issues um, arising and I'm getting closer on the theoretical paper. <coughs> but um, it's, it's not all over. So I'm going to ask you to talk about the Probably my question is more directed to uh, what Richard has um, proposed as the uh, interesting research topics in post-2015. And I, my question is about um, the, the issue of uh, internet governance or the issue of the governance mechanisms that is uh, triggered or enabled by internet supported socio-economic activities. I'm not, not only talking about privacy, I'm also talking about the institutional change that uh, has been made possible by internet in the areas of the, in a sense that government sees internet not, a, not necessarily as a challenge of its regime, but more like a, a useful instrument to reinforce its regimes. So I'm just wondering how you know, ICT4D researchers are placing their uh, directions of efforts in this field because I think there has been a lot of researchers in other uh, disciplines, say, uh, in studies of lawyers. They are already jumping into these areas, but I've, I've seen very little uh, these kind of governance or internet trigger the governance issues uh, showing up in, in, in our. Yes, I think, I think it reflects to, to some degree what Prasanthi was saying, but there's been quite a focus on the micro level of, of people call it e-governance, but I, I think by and large they really mean e-government, in other words, kind of projects, driver's license, passports, tax payments, um, yeah. that sort of thing. I think the focus in, in quite a bit of, much of the ICT for D literature has been around that, rather than the broader, what truly might be called if not quite e-governance, then the internet and governance and, uh, and ICTs and, and governance. I'm sure there's going to be an increasing interest in that area, but there are so many sort of sub-audiences that arise these days. So that kind of work, one stumbles across it in internet 
journals like uh, there's policy and internet is there, or New Eden Society, and those, those sorts of areas. There's yeah. an audience there which is working on that area, and I've not seen that particularly within the ICT for the field itself. That doesn't mean it isn't ICT for development research, it simply means that it doesn't appear very much, I suppose, within the what I call the, the, those, the, those water and holes of, of, of ICT for the related research, the, the journal that I listed and uh, in various conferences and so on. But I'm, but I'm sure that's really important and I think it probably also links therefore to what Kathy was saying as well about this notion of societal challenges. There's definitely a a leap motif going around in information systems as well as that the, the dark side of the internet, the dark side of ICTs there. I forget what the journal special issue has just come out about things that you call that isn't the dark side of, of information of information systems. And I think there's um, a lot more work to be done on that whole area. We had a discussion um, online regarding the website about a month ago looking at looking at technology assessment which used to be done back in the kind of 70s and 80s, looking at what were the issues and problems that might arise with technologies and arguing that that kind of technology assessment problem needs to be done for ICTs as well because we've got all of these issues like privacy, surveillance, computer crime and many, many issues that at the moment in most ICT for the initiatives they just are not, not really being thought about mm -hmm. at all and yet clearly have some very serious implications. Some comments on that. The topic IT and development is huge intellectuals. It's intellectually one of the most uh, uh, ambitious uh, questions uh, humanity is facing nowadays development. And then we add an amazingly uh, transformative, potentially, technology. So we have this huge question uh, with that very many ramifications uh, but it concerns humanity and its existence on the planet um, and then of course we try to address that from our very institutionalized very uh, streamlined uh, ways of studying and doing research so there are mentions about publications uh, Kathy argued for the significance of critical realism, um, very specific mechanism, another methodology. These things absolutely we need to master and be able to exist in academia. Publish, do the REF, publish in good journals who have amazingly uh, limited and conservative policies, of course. So, if you put the two together, they're not much. They leave a huge gap, uh, gap, the hugely important, open, complex question, and the very limited, very conservative um, ways that we do research in uh, academia. Um, I think that particularly um, young researchers need to address their existential problems first in academia and learn the rituals of publishing and master one methodology and uh, one theory and put it together and uh, convince an editor. But please, as you do that, can you also allow yourself um, in your brains room for uh, big questions? Dare to question what is happening here, for God's sake. Um, is it really a conspiracy theory that with technology the gap between the poor and the rich exponentially increases nowadays and then we put together an agenda which has here and there will do that and of course will tackle poverty and will uh, tackle uh, inequality. I mean, uh, absorb the kind of things that we all do and then we totally ignore of course in our uh, writing and uh, thinking and acting as intellectuals, you know, news like uh, the abduction of girls in Nigeria, what happens in Syria. I mean, uh, these are issues of development, aren't they? Um, what are, is their nature? What is technology, in a way, offering for that? I mean, can we bridge the gap between aspects which 
we would recognize as development issues and challenges, and the technologies we talk about, you cannot publish a paper if you do that. No editor will accept it. You have to put together a very specific project with a very specific methodology with your data and some conclusions that probably say nothing or say very, very little. But in your mind, please keep these questions alive and do try to imagine um, possible states of the world, possible ways that technology associates or doesn't associate, and do a critique as it's very much the role of the academia to critique. But to critique, you need to understand what is happening. You need to engage with the political economy in the old-fashioned and new theories of political economy and other uh, ways of thinking that is available and develop your own um, seeds of thought of what is happening here and do dare to debate among yourselves and probably at some point the conditions will mature that you can express it and even publish it. We are desperately <coughs> needing uh, this kind of uh, thinking to keep it alive. The conditions of academia do not encourage it at all. The conditions of academia are so conservative that do not allow us to address questions of development. They are completely against that. Um, but you're young people. That future is yours, it's not mine. And you need to be able to imagine it in its worst and its probably ways of improving and dare to think why is it like that and how could it be different? Practically, as well as, you know, in a big transformative way. And then you'll spend six or seven years on a case study trying to... Um, well, don't publish one paper. You, <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking about just trying to, I'm not talking about publication there. I'm talking about trying to make sense of what is actually going on um, in, in that uh, context. Apparently provocative, and that's some energy, um, which is that um, you three of introduce lots of problems, issues, and challenges, and that's what you've been talking about. Is there anything that you three can commit to and tell us about in this field that is worth doing? So what do you mean? <laughs> well, I know Kathy McGrath's uh, history on her critical realism and her engagement with it. I think I do. Um, some of it. Is there, is, there some, is there something there that is actually useful that uh, we could actually uh, learn from uh, uh, in terms of whether critical realism can help us to study these things. What have you learned about mechanisms and causation and where where are we with that that we can actually... Mechanisms and causation and theories... Well, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, Richard, sure. Richard, what agenda would you, would you choose going forward that you think is really valuable? So, I mean, one can deal with that probably three levels then of, of what, what one wants to hang on to the kind of the, the philosophical, the realism potential, the, the theoretical and, and then also the practical as, as well. When I got, because Anthony and I have both sort of grown up around information systems in developing countries with a very similar group, particularly around life at WG94, around the turn of the, the, the century, I remember thinking to myself, I, I, I can't carry on like because essentially we've been critical about everything. And I'm not going to spend my life um, just saying what's bad about stuff. And I'm going to go and I'm going to try and find out some positive models and some positive applications. I was looking at these, particularly at the, at the practical level, that I can believe in and I can commit to. And, that, and that's by and large what I, what I try to do at the moment. I recognize that the, the, there's necessarily some element of blinkering in that because every, everything has feet of clay to, uh, to a certain extent. But uh, that's what we're trying to do, particularly in Manchester, is look at some things that we feel positive about um, that are going on in the field of ICTs and, and development. So although I mentioned the dark side of, 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 of ICTs, I've, um, my research has not yet been drawn to the dark side. And, okay, so what are some, some of the things? Impact sourcing, what we used to call social, social outsourcing before Rockefeller told us to change it. Um, I, I think that looks like a very positive and, uh, and, and interesting model. 
inclusive innovation, I think that's a very that's very interesting as well about how do we develop ICTs for basically pyramid communities or the models that we should use. Digital enterprises, digital hubs, incubators and so on, I think those are creating uh, those are creating jobs in kind of striving that's really not around for ICTs. Um, resilience is another issue. I, yeah, resilience is something that I think individuals, households, communities, and nations are going to have to build and have to have far more in the 21st century. We've got a, a very, we've got a strong program of practice and, and theorization around, around that. I could, I could go, but but that that's that's it's not particularly <coughs> about the specifics. I think it's about one's approach to research and, and the topics and the, and the and the areas that uh, that one. Picks up on. And if you look at very successful careers in this, in this academic careers in this area, I think you see that pattern. I always look at Jeff, I'm sure most of us do, at Jeff Walsh's career and kind of think, yeah, that's, that's very much what I like. And he picked up particularly on interpretivism as something he felt positive about. There was a gap, and he kind of spent many, many years suddenly on the same stuff. In fact, he was a good career direction, very similar. You know, he looked at something that I don't know whether you feel particularly positive, always about. Sourcing and outsourcing, and, and so on, but you know, we've, we've really sort of promoted that as, um, as, as an area where we really want to be very, very deep track on that. So that's the kind of thing I, I, I was trying to achieve, albeit in too fragmented a way. I want to come back to, to Chrysanthemum, because we've had an interesting conversation. Jeff came to the uh, UK Association of Information Systems and gave a talk about ICTs and information systems and societal challenges. And we got into a discussion about the importance of much along the lines that, that Krizanti has just said, you know, don't lose sight of the grand challenges in society and trying to make a contribution towards those. And there were a number of people who work in business schools there who just said, you need to recognize it's very easy for you, particularly easy for me, because I work in the Development Studies Institute. Well, nobody questions the fact that we're looking at the grand challenges of inequality, poverty, climate change, and so on, because that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. But that in business schools, how they felt the space for looking at those, those the, the big issues in society was, and, and, and IS was being squeezed out. And, and uh, because students, they said, on MBA programs, just totally not interested in it. If they've been able to protect specific programs on information systems, there may be opportunities there. So if you've got an information systems department, or maybe the internet studies group and so on, there are opportunities there. But in mainstream business schools, the, 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 that, that opportunity may be being squeezed. I thought that was very interesting and kind of slightly worrying that, that, that if there was a squeeze on the areas in which we're able to have build academic careers around information systems and the challenges, and it's odd as well, because at the same time, universities, and the same as Manchester, I mean, Manchester's developed a third mission alongside teaching and research. It's a third mission of social responsibility, addressing the grand challenges. So there's kind of, there's this rhetoric of, from universities on the one hand, and yet when it comes down to specific academic careers, it may be, I don't know whether the spaces are being squeezed, but certainly you probably want to think about where you are operating. It may be much easier actually to operate in this area in a development studies rather than a business school, or it may be easier in an information systems group rather than in a, in a mainstream business school. Uh, I'd like to respond to mostly. I'll give you two reasons for uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing that have got nothing to do with uh, getting a paper published but and doing them because I think they're important and I care about them. Um, the first is, uh, in terms of uh, pursuing uh, the development of um, causal explanations in the middle range theory, I think that's important because um, for quite some time now I've questioned my own research um, in terms of saying, can I not offer something more than just um, some apparent insights into a case um, and um, a conclusion that says it may be helpful in another setting. So the very practical question that I allege is the question that everybody wants answered, which is will this technology work for me or why, for whom, and in what conditions um, does this technology work? 
So I think that's a very important question, and I'm trying to answer it. Maybe I'm not trying to answer it with the right case material, but whatever, I think it's an important question and I'd like to do it. The second thing, with the particular case that I am looking at, um, I want to actually get some insight into what's happening there. I look at some of the things that are happening there and think, why aren't people complaining? Why, why aren't people frustrated by the fact that nothing is happening here? And why is nothing happening here? I actually want to understand. Um, but you have read sense from a billion, you said. Sorry? You have read sense from a billion, you said. I've read it. There is an answer there. Um, uh, all right. We'll discuss that. We'll discuss that later. But I, I, I want to answer the question, um, Leslie. I, I, I find it some of the explanations that are being offered by the people that um, were interviewed just don't cut it with me. I want to probe further. I want to find out how it can be as it is. If, uh, okay, if I can invite a last round of questions, I see quite a lot of hands. Okay, maybe very to the point questions for the last uh, few minutes. Sonia? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I, um, as I agree with what Richard said. It's probably, I come from a human geography department, and development studies is much more open than what would be. So I was wondering if you know. Um, how the capability approach is using is being used for ICTs with the choices framework of Dorothea Klein, and as well if you have considered using technofeminism from uh, Wagman, which is uh, of course gender studies, but is much more political and is a, is a is a view of technology that allows that kind of view of different levels of of these uh, issues in society that are not sometimes in other, in other the theories. So for me, mixing those last part, Paulo Freire is actually helping me to make these hard questions as much as the uh, basic question, like having an analysis that is multi-leveled. Have you ever considered? This, this is to me. Uh, uh, for both of the ladies, because you both yeah. talked about theory more um, than yeah. you for me, um, taking elements of the capability approach and, and mixing that with other concepts is not what I was trying to do. That's, that's a, a fairly classical way to do an interpretive study that you take some concepts from uh, one author and some other concepts that will maybe help you understand another part of the phenomenon and put them together to get some insight into it. That's not what I was trying to do. Um, I took um, the capability framework as just something that said there is a relationship between um, commodities or services and capabilities or potentialities that people can have and achieve outcomes. And I wanted, the work that I wanted to do was identify the causal mechanisms in there that get you from commodities to or services to outcomes through the notion of capabilities. So I'm actually looking at putting, uh, developing those concepts myself inductively and then and, and producing a causal relationship um, as a result. Uh, it's just the, I'm just working on the broad framework. Okay, now um, I'm working with that in the capability approach as well, so I'm wondering, are you using as well uh, the structural constraints or conversion, convention, uh, conversion factors are an adaptive preferences, which are obviously things that impact that the change that you're talking. We can talk about this later. Uh, there are all <laughs> kinds of different theories, and I'm agnostic about uh, what specific theory and what model you use and how you work on that. <coughs> this is, if you like, the craftsmanship of research as academics. We learn how to play with these things to uh, try one thing, uh, doesn't work, try something else. But I do realize that there are, if you like, layers of theory in terms of degree of abstraction. And what I referred to is, at least in the information system, we did tackle, and we do need to tackle on the issue of development as well, the fundamental question of the causal mechanism between 
uh, technology, <coughs> the IT artifact, the internet, you know, the mobile phone, etc., etc., with its specific functionalities and how we develop it, and the social change. Now, this is the kind of theory that STS does, the studies of science and technology. Uh, the structuration doesn't have technology, but if it had, it would be at that level of abstraction. And we do need that because that is directing our attention to what feasibly, plausibly, we might expect to find when we try to understand what is happening here and what might happen in the future. On top of that, of course, you cannot go away all uh, and have you know, your research question answered on the, the basis of such foundational theory. You then need more specific theories for the kind of thing that you study. And theories of political um, economy are very much necessary. There isn't that much research in our field of technology and political economy. We need it. And sense theory is another theory of that kind, which is, would be very, very useful, I'm sure. But at that level, I'm agnostic. There are all kinds. There is another theory that uh, Richard has in his paper, and it seems to me that it is extremely promising, and I hope that we'll see more of that in the future, which is uh, complex systems theory. Uh, another very general abstract theory, uh, but was neglected. We stopped thinking in terms of systems. We stopped, started thinking in terms of networks. I wonder what were the implications of this uh, different discourse. One has control and power and recognizes this and boundaries, etc. And the other is how nice relations, connections, etc., etc. What a nice world we are with the internet. So, what theory you choose has implications about uh, how, how you, you think. I would say we have time for one conclusive question and then for a conclusive round of uh, comments. So, one last question. Can I have a uh, thank you very much for the presentation once again. Uh, my question is about uh, inclusive development, uh, which uh, Richard um, I anticipate as a like, prior, uh, prior agenda for the future. So within the ICT for development field, we have like mobile uh, ICT enabled citizens feedback, like you know, open government, all kind of this kind of uh, ITC optimism, um, um, like, uh, based on like, ICT optimism like projects. But uh, from my kind of uh, field experiences, I personally thought that the most serious problem is the demand side of ICT enable um, citizen feedback mechanism. Because uh, the, what is happening in the field is like people doesn't necessarily uh, uh, interested in giving a feedback. But after the initial like kind of enthusiasm to, to give a feedback, they lost um, like kind of um, giving a feedback. There's no incentive for people, I mean, citizen, to give a feedback. So I mean. Um, there's kind of been a controversy, but for my perspective, Daraza, Daraza project um, um, is kind of you know, a typical uh, example. Like Kenya, Kenya open data um, is, uh, I would argue, like is I mean, kind of failing, and also like other like um, kind of ICT enabled system mechanisms kind of you know failing. So my quest, biggest question is how 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 we could like kind of sustain like this. Um, driving force for inclusive development, how, how we could just give an give a incentive for the citizens to engage in the development process. Okay, um, I mean I think the first thing I'd say is inclusive development, that's one fraction of, of, of inclusivity which is inclusive governance. I exactly, gave, yeah. I gave a couple of other examples that I think are, are, are working much better perhaps, which is inclusive innovation and inclusive business. As, as, as well, but I mean, there are arguments as well about benefits in, in both cases. So the inclusive development you have to remember is a huge agenda. Yeah, exactly. And there are many, many different. But we need the ICT development, ICT for development field. The most you know, significant inclusive development agenda is like citizen feedback I by using the ICT and open that. government. I wouldn't agree with that. I'm afraid I'd say that's, okay. just, that's just one. That's just one area. Uh, you know, there, there are many. There are many areas. So, so I wouldn't just reduce it to to just that one area. But fine, the challenges you expose are great and, and, and clearly important. And I, I mean, I don't know uh, in, enough, about, uh, enough about the area, but I mean, one of the key things I know that goes wrong with those projects is that there's no, there's no feedback loop. In other words, citizens feel that they're giving, they're giving data and nothing ever kind of comes back to them in terms of the fact that the water supply gets fixed when they report it, or the fact that a politician is thrown out of office when they, when they report back, or the fact that money 
money flows improve. So, so it's it's the kind of it's the age-old problem of the information chain, which is essentially that that, that it's da there's data, but it never turns into information, decisions, actions, and, and, and results. So you've got in, in in kind of framework terms, it's very simple to work out what what should happen. How do you actually incentivize those? What you ultimately need, of course, is you need political support and political change, and then we come back exactly to what Chris Anthony was talking about, which is, first of all, we need to work out how do we even conceptualize what's going on. And one thing you don't conceptualize is just on the basis of data, information, decision, actions, and results. You need to have this institutional political economy framework around what you're doing, and then you can really start to understand why things change and why things don't. That's not, I mean, I should tell you, for example, this part of institutionalism and the mean. Institutionalism is not a completely conservative view on the world that says it's all path dependent and nothing ever changes because there are always conflicting agendas, there are always exogenous factors like technical changes that bring in change, but you have to understand the world through those lenses. And I think one of the big problems with many of the projects is they have been understood from a data driven or technology driven approach rather than from a socio-political and institutional approach. Um, I just wonder if there's any final comment from uh, Kathy. On this question, or generally? Uh, the only final comment I would like to make in response to, to uh, Leslie's actually challenge is that uh, of course, one can think uh, uh, of the value of our work as sharpening our tools, uh, theories, methodologies, for generally being able to tackle and understand uh, socio-technical uh, uh, questions. Uh, and we all get, from time to time, uh, satisfaction from doing that in publications, etc., just by being able ourselves to put things together and say, oh, right, now I understand that, or that's something. Um, in terms of, well, and all this work of my life, what is it actually worth? <laughs> Which is the kind of question that hits you at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're writing with uh, a glass of whiskey in your hand. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, uh, you know, I totally understand, and I remember probably one of uh, the conferences where um, uh, Richard described his transformation to I need to take a more positive uh, attitude to the world, otherwise I'll commit suicide. <laughs> um, well, on the other hand, I do believe that uh, one of the core values of academia, because if academia doesn't do it, nobody will do it is um, well thought out uh, critique. So critique for me is extremely valuable uh, contribution. It doesn't have to be positive. I did the old positive art, uh, uh, paper and it's satisfactory. You know, you can say something good at the end. But my God, when you are faced with the issue of development nowadays and the technology galloping in innovation, and so very small steps towards improving human life and dangers cropping up uh, in all kinds of ways, I think critique is a major contribution. And if I manage to do a critique that makes sense to others, I would feel very proud. So it's the nature of the topic that I don't understand how you can study IT development and not be critical. It's intrinsic. Uh, if, if I could do the same, I would be, I would be really um, delighted. <laughs> okay, I guess this brings our event to close. So I would like, uh, as a member of the ASRF team, and also as myself, an ICTD researcher, to thank uh, and uh, to. I deservedly thank our speakers for an extremely fascinating, extremely fruitful debate, and uh, uh, which uh, really made a great, I'd say, contribution to bringing the STD debate back to the sea. Something that I was very excited about before this event, and even more now. So, <laughs> <laughs>